Today I'm going to talk about EMDR and how it works and basically the effects of EMDR. I'm going to do it in three parts. <clears throat> so first we'll talk about the symptoms and trauma that EMDR helps. Uh, how EMDR works in the brain will be another part of it. And then uh, we'll go into the EMDR process and the next, you know, the next step of, of what you'd want to do if you decided to do EMDR. This presentation is for uh, clients. I'd like my clients to, to watch it. So this is what I tell clients in sessions. So uh, this is probably going to be a little more thorough, so it should fill in what we talk about. And then also we wouldn't need to use as much time in a session going over EMDR. Uh, but also it's for anybody who's interested. You know, if you think you're interested in EMDR, if you've heard about it or going to an EMDR therapist, want to find out a little more about it, then uh, hopefully this will tell you. Also the presentation is for other therapists. If you're an EMDR therapist, you might watch it and give me some feedback. Also, if you're not an EMDR therapist, the, this could be a good place to find out about it uh, I'd, and to find out uh, if you want to learn it, for one thing. If you're a, you know, a licensed mental health professional, you can take the training or uh, when you should refer clients. So I'm going to talk how EMDR works, uh, why it is different from other therapies, um, what makes it effective, you know, what makes it uh, uh, work in a way that other therapies don't, and then who could benefit from it. Of course, uh, EMDR, we work with anxiety and depression, which is really the underlying, uh, underlies all of any mental uh, problems. Um, usually there would be some kind of anxiety or depression. Attachment difficulties, so that's relationship problems. EMDR is helpful in that. Emotional regulation, so learning how to regulate or uh, emotions, emotional development, maturity, that kind of thing. And then um, EMDR helps with anger and irritation and emotional upset. There's a microbrewery in Birdsview, Washington. There's the, that's what it says, Birdsview Brewery, I think, and then this is the building. Actually, it's much bigger than, than it looks. It was built by the brewmaster, Bill. He's a good guy. Uh, inside the bar is the sign that says, basically, beer has food value, but food has no beer value. And you know, I always thought that was kind of funny when I first saw it. But the other morning, I woke up and I realized that the same could be said about EMDR, which is basically that EMDR has counseling value, but regular counseling has no EMDR value. And so what I'm saying here is that there's something that EMDR does in the brain that other therapies don't do. Uh, I guess the analogy holds with beer as well, but um, I mean that beer does things in the brain that food doesn't do. Uh, but in this case we're looking at uh, counseling and how to get the most effective uh, experience. EMDR was started by a woman named Francine Shapiro. It's Francine here about 21 years ago. And she apparently was walking across the field. Her eyes and noticed that her eyes were moving back and forth. She uh, realized that if she would move her eyes back and forth purposefully while she was having a disturbing thought, then the disturbance would lessen. She took this to her fellow uh, colleagues, other psychologists, I guess, and then they uh, worked with it a while and then came up with a process uh, called EMDR. And they first did the process on uh, war veterans, uh, sex abuse survivors and the police who had had uh, traumatic uh, situations. So it was first founded on trauma and is known uh, really to be a very, the most effective treatment, I think, to be used with trauma. But the thing that makes sense and that I, that I think other EMDR therapists get 
is that if it's as effective as it is on trauma, then it can really be used on anything. I mean, it works on the high ends, so not, why not use it on the low end kinds of difficulties? Um, that's, that's what I do in my practice. Uh, and I would encourage you, if you do EMDR, to find an EMDR therapist who has moved away from just doing EMDR on trauma, like that, to where they use it, um, you know, most of the time with most, most clients on a wide variety of issues. So here are some of the, the issues that EMDR helps with, and I'll go through it uh, briefly. Uh, panic attacks, so obvious anxiety there. Uh, lingering grief, and that's grief that goes on for a long time, obviously. Uh, and so people are suffering from that, you know, more sadness than they think they should, really, or that seems normal. And it's not that EMDR just takes away the grief, but it's that it takes the stabbing uh, pain out of it. Out of it. Uh, it helps with sleeping. Uh, a lot of people have sleep problems. EMDR can help with that. Uh, performance anxiety is um, for sports or actually for studying, taking tests, uh, and any kind, playing the piano on stage. I guess any kind of performance where there's anxiety, uh, EMDR processing, we can use it to, to enhance the performance, really. Sports I talked about, especially, you know, if there's been a sports injury or a sports uh, event, a trauma event, uh, EMDR can help with that. Uh, bad game, bad experience. Um, first responders, these are medical people who, you know, the ambulance people, but it really anybody in the ER uh, really could benefit from EMDR. Eating disorders, this eating disorders covers overeating. You know, look for childhood issues where the, if it's a habit started or the, whatever's going on there. You also look for current triggers in overeating. Uh, you can also do EMDR on under eating, you know, the bulimia those kinds of things. Really, for those people who have anorexia bulimia, you should work with an EMDR therapist who specializes in that as well. Uh, chronic pain, easy EMDR is amazing with chronic pain. It doesn't, it's not that it makes the chronic pain go away, uh, but it does, it can lessen the pain. And then also it can change the relationship to the pain. And also it can change the belief, of, Usually people that have chronic pain don't uh, have a hard time feeling good about themselves. So an EMDR can help with that. Uh, nightmares, um, so far I've had very good success in helping people who have nightmares to come in and do EMDR on the nightmare and it will uh, not happen anymore. Phobias, those are like fears, uh, fears of flying, uh, fears of eating food, certain foods, people have that and EMDR will clear that up. War trauma, and I think the main thing here is any war. You know, there are a lot of uh, people still from the Vietnam War, I think, who could benefit, or uh, probably not World War II, but, but you know, who could, but Vietnam and later, who could benefit from EMDR? And certainly then the recent people. Uh, and then any, sexual or physical abuse, any of the symptoms of it that show up later in life. That EMDR, in fact, EMDR just should be a part of any sexual abuse treatment. And that doesn't mean necessarily that you have to go to an EMDR therapist. Uh, what I'm recommending here is that if you're working with a therapist, then you would be referred out to an EMDR therapist for certain issues. With your therapist, what you do would be to to find issues that EMDR should be used on and then you would be referred out for, to work on those issues and then come back or stay with your regular therapist through that. So EMDR stands for Eye Movement uh, Desensitization and Reprocessing. Basically, um, the eye movement is where you move your eyes back and forth. The therapist will hold their fingers up like that and move their eyes horizontally and then the eyes follow the fingers and then uh, that's used in the processing. There's also a light bar, which is a, 
a big long bar that has lights across it and the eyes follow the light. I used to use one of those. Actually, I've gone to using sound. What I do is have people put on headphones. I've got them here. And so you just put on headphones like that. And then I hook them up to this little box here, this unit, which is called the TAC Audio Scan. And I plug it in and then turn it on. And what that does is starts a beep, and it beeps in one ear and then the other. You can kind of see a light going back and forth. The other thing I do is use these pulsers, and they're like this, and they plug into the audio scan like this. So now I've got two things plugged in, as you can see, and then it's beeping back and forth. So I'm getting a beep here, and then a buzzing in this, uh, these handheld units here. So when it beeps in one ear, then it buzzes in, in the same ear, and it goes back and forth. And so that's called bilateral stimulation. So we use sounds, alternating beeps, and then the tappers uh, for vibrations in the hands. What the bilateral stimulation does, this says bilateral stimulation up here. Uh, what that does is it causes the brain to start thinking on its own. Now that's pretty amazing. It's pretty, it's subtle, you follow, we follow a process, so you, but you can see it happening when it's happening in the session. It's always uh, interesting, surprising a little. What it does is it follows neural networks in the brain. So the brain is apparently made up of these neural networks, and so when we start activating it, then the brain will start thinking down a certain uh, network or track in the brain. It brings up then thoughts, feelings, and body sensations uh, a lot of times usually associated with that network. And in the process of doing that then, it resolves and integrates uh, memories that are stored in the midbrain. Now this is the difference between uh, EMDR and other therapies. You see, with EMDR what we're doing is we're working at the midbrain level. And uh, so, just, so just talking about things, doing cognitive restructuring, uh, it, which is good. I mean, all of, you know, all of what you do, have done is good, hopefully. But there's one piece that isn't getting addressed, which is this, uh, the way the emotional uh, memory and the body sensation memory is stored in the midbrain. And so with the bilateral stimulation following the certain protocol, then we're able to allow the brain to let go of those memories uh, so that they don't keep getting activated. So the D in EMDR stands for desensitization. And what we're doing is we're desensitizing the emotional pain that's associated with any uh, specific event or a group of, event, of events. And then the R here, the MDR, stands for reprocessing. And this is more subtle, but it's also very, very powerful. Uh, and actually, EMDR was first called EMD because, uh, I guess, Fran, they didn't see this component of it which is basically that uh, the way the brain starts, well, the way the brain thinks about something starts to change. And you know, one of the more frustrating things um, when we have friends that, that are in a situation and they're blaming themselves, but, but we know it's not their fault. You might tell them that, but they still don't seem to get it. Uh, this is true for a lot of uh, sexual abuse survivors, that they blame themselves. When you can say, well, you, you, didn't, you didn't cause that to happen to you. You were five, and your perpetrator was 25. Uh, but at any rate, when you do EMDR, then people seem to get those kind of connections or awareness or realization on their own, uh, which is then much more powerful. We look at trauma with EMDR. Although I'm, I'm also suggesting that we move away from the idea that EMDR is only for trauma. Uh, but in the EMDR model, then we have what we call big T trauma. 
which is uh, when you're confronted with a life-threatening uh, situation or serious injury, could be to yourself or to another person. Uh, with that kind of trauma, there's fear, helplessness, or terror. Uh, what's kind of interesting is that, that even though people have this, not a, not a lot of people report it. Uh, so sometimes we have to kind of look for it. The, th the thing with big, well, with any trauma, so we can go here, is that it has a lingering effect on the emotional body, is why it's a problem. Uh, little t trauma, this is what we're more used to seeing, what people have more. Uh, it's chronic or long term, so it's something that happens over a period of time. And many of the childhood experiences fall in the category of uh, little t trauma. They're really, they're not thought of tra as traumatic at the time. Um, you know, parents arguing with each other, uh, a parent has a negative attitude and lays it on the kid. You know, the way kids sometimes mistreat each other, those kinds of things. Uh, but, and, if, and these are the kind of things that if they're done once or twice are probably not a big deal. But um, if it's done chronically over a long period of time, then it has a huge effect on the person's ability to function effectively as an adult. I want to break here and just mention that uh, a small t trauma also includes major childhood events like childhood sexual abuse or things. Uh, there are a lot of things actually that have a major impact on the emotional body uh, but are not necessarily a life-threatening uh, trauma or situation they still can have the same negative emotional effect. The other part that I think is important and not often talked about, I think, is just emotionally charged experiences. So people have a lot of those. We have those throughout our lifetime. And what happens is when you have a highly charged emotional experience, it changes the way the memory is stored. And, uh, and, and that's, the that's the difference or the difficulty because the memory gets stored in a way that it doesn't just resolve. Anyway, these are experiences that have a negative lingering effect. Now, in the holdings from uh, these experiences, emotionally charged experiences, uh, can be subtle. In other words, you don't know that's what's causing this high level of, of anxiousness, let's say, or low level of depression. Uh, but it's also destructive to the autonomic nervous system. And so that's, and, and that's one of the issues we see, like with chronic pain, uh, the arthritis kinds of things, any autoimmune disease, I guess, uh, <clears throat> that over a period of years, like 20 or 30 years, then that has the effect on the body causing it to start to break down. And that's, that's due to unresolved trauma in the mind. So being bullied are some examples, uh, homework in school, you know, worrying, having bad experiences with schoolwork or teachers, uh, losses, any deaths that you've experienced. Uh, some people, it's not a problem, but for some people, the death of a grandparent or parent uh, or a friend, you know, can have a difficult time recovering from that uh, emotionally. Moves, we don't think of that, but childhood moves, you know. Some people go through lots of childhood moves and it's not a big deal. Some have a few and it's, and it's a problem for them. Divorces and affairs are also reasons uh, to use EMDR or, or things in life that cause uh, emotionally charged experiences. Uh, and I think that's often overlooked. What happens is the event is persistently re-experienced, the event or events, and through thinking about it all the time or dreaming about it. But most often what happens is strong feelings are triggered very easily. Uh, they're subtle and not easily recognized. So what we're saying here is that people go around in life having had a lot of emotionally charged, or even one or two, but emotionally charged experiences that are unresolved, and the feelings from those experiences That's keep true. getting triggered over and over. And that causes problems in day-to-day -day functioning. 
other symptoms people have that EMDR can be helpful for is difficulty falling or staying asleep, um, irritability, outbursts of anger. I just think it can't be stressed enough that if, if people have an anger issue, then EMDR should be done. And I, I don't think that's understood stood or appreciated by most uh, therapists who work with anger. But what I'm suggesting is there's an emotional component to anger that is not about learning about anger, not about the current situation. It's not about even thinking differently. Uh, difficulty concentrating, EMDR can help. So hypervigilance is when you're tuned into the environment around you, like hearing conversations close to you, being super aware of, uh, of what's going on to the point of distraction, to the point that it keeps the nervous system charged up and it can't function effectively. Then people can also have an exaggerated startle response, which is kind of interesting. That charges people up. So it's not just that you jump, like if a balloon goes off in a restaurant, you jump, um, you know, dive under the table or something. But that's not really the problem with that. The problem with that is it changes the whole emotional set in the body for uh, the next day or two, really. So in other words, you're irritable, upset, easily set off, not reasonable. And you don't really know why, but it's related to um, you know, a sound in the environment that startled you. So one thing about the symptoms is that they are difficult to separate from everyday life. That they're so kind of mixed. It's not like you have these symptoms of problem, emotional difficulties, and then life's over here. It's like everything's kind of blended together. And, uh, EMDR helps with the shame-based behaviors, um, which are the addictions, and really all addictions. You know, if you're dealing with an addiction, then you should be uh, doing EMDR. And if you're an addiction, Therapist, then you, you should be helping your clients uh, find those uh, places to do EMDR on, touchstone events or triggers to desensitize and then do EMDR on those. This is all addictions, everyone. Um, and more of the treatment centers are starting to become aware of this, actually. Failed relationships, if you get failed in relationships over and over, well, uh, EMDR counseling would be helpful. Anger, so back to anger, but um, definitely if there's anger going on, it takes more than just changing thinking. Stress, stress symptoms, so that's the chronic illness. Uh, you know, if, you, if the body is always being activated, if the autonomic nervous system is always being activated, it's under stress all the time uh, from worry or anxiety or tension, then that's an underlying problem uh, for chronic illness. I don't think that's appreciated by the medical community. They talk about stress a little bit, and you know you should uh, relax once in a while, whatever they say. But but the uh, but if they got it, they would be sending people to EMDR therapists to get some treatment. Now the conf the confusing part about this, I would say, or difficult part, is that. Once you take the stress down in a system uh, using EMDR, that doesn't mean it just recovers immediately and is back to full speed. You know, it took years for people to get in the shape where their body is breaking down because of stress. So just lowering the stress in the system, lowering the chronic uh, emotional memories that are stored in the system so they're not getting triggered all the time uh, doesn't it allows the body to start recovering but it can take a couple of years to recover it can take a while to get back it may never get back to full function but it will get better and then procrastination kind of interesting i've had very good success with procrastination actually doing emdr on procrastination and uh, it's, it's been good. In other words, people come in, we do EMDR on the procrastination, and then the next week they report they're not procrastinating. They actually got done uh, what they wanted to do. And I would compare that to talking about procrastination 
And uh, really that's, uh, you know, talking about procrastination, trying to get a strategy together on how you're going to overcome it, setting goals and all that, is really just another uh, form of procrastination. Uh, the other symptoms we're looking at, which I, you know, this may be a loaded term, but, but it's emotional immaturity. I think that's what we're dealing with as a culture, as a world, really. Uh, people who are unable to sit, who calm themselves down, unable to kind of pull things down, no? unable to focus and concentrate, unable to let things go, kind of let it slide off. And um, so EMDR helps with that. The other piece that I don't think is, is explored enough is, uh, <clears throat> you know, the way people become emotionally attached to unhealthy situations are other people. And uh, I think that uh, deeper emotional attachment that somehow keeps people in domestic violence relationships or, uh, you know, uh, attached to people who hurt them, basically, uh, can be addressed with EMDR effectively. So now we're going to talk about how EMDR works in the brain.